What's up, everyone? It's Jay Ray, the co-host of Q Points. And one really important way that you can support our show is by subscribing to it wherever you listen to podcasts. Q Points is pretty much everywhere. One of those places where you can subscribe and we highly encourage it is on Apple Podcasts. If you visit qpnt.net forward slash Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe to the show and listen to all of the, um, the episodes. And please, 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 Leave us five stars because you know you love Q points and leave us a review. We really want to hear from you and it helps to spread the word about the show. It's that simple. Thanks so much for tuning into Q points and thank you so much for supporting us. Have a great one. That intro never gets old. Hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. It's so fun. It's just plain fun. <laughs> Shout out to Johnny Dynamite. Shout out to Johnny Dynamite. What's up, J Ray? Listen. What's up, party people? We here. Welcome I... to another episode of Q Points. points. I'm Is that singing. The theme song. That's what we going with. Sure. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm going to let you do that. Sure, right. <laughs> Once again, I am DJ Sir Daniel. Hey, everybody. My name is Jay Ray, and I also go by my government of Johnny Ray Cornegay III. And welcome back to Q Points, a visual podcast, our space for meaningful dialogue about the global impact of Black music. We welcome you again, Jay Ray. It is June it's June. We're officially halfway through 2021 already. That is beautiful. And 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 people are going outside and being Listen, together. It's great. It's it's a it's a done data. We out here, we we out here, we doing this thing. And being that it's June, we have to acknowledge three major moments in the month of June. One It marks the beginning of Pride, so happy Pride to all. Happy Pride, everyone. Allies and everybody. Mm -hmm. Two, June also marks the beginning of Black Music Month. It very much is Black Music Month, yes. And you probably didn't know this, but June is also Bonnet Awareness Month. Listen, listen, sweet babies. (laughs) Listen, welcome (laughs) to the show, sweet babies. My sweet, sweet babies. I welcome you into my bosom. Look at now. <laughs> Where's my bonnet? We need bonnets. Uh, DJ Sir Daniel, we got to get some bonnets uh, so we can bring a them bonnet to the show. Or, or do rag or something. Yes, you all know. of the above. <laughs> all of the above because we representing ourselves as kings, but in a funky fly way as well. Funky fresh, dressed Loving to impress, ready to party. That part. Loving the t-shirt. Thank you. Shout out to DDM. Shout out to DDM. In Baltimore. Absolutely. Uh, the Ballad of Omar is one. And if you haven't heard it's the on. Ballad of Omar, go get it. It is a year old. You know what else happened this week in 1993? No, what? Janet Jackson filmed the video for If. Really? Yes. Okay. Um, if. With the iconic breakdown, the dance breakdown, mm, 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 which mm, 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 that part right there, yep, which is a sample. Yes, yes, it is sample. Mm-hmm. A sample that if you are if you are a fan of Hitman Howie T and the Real Rock Sand, it comes from the song Bang Zoom, um, Baby Let's Go Go, mm-hmm. and J Ray. Let me tell you something that that's a perfect segue into our topic because during last week's show. Mm-hmm. We discussed summer anthems. Yes. Including the City Girls Smash Twerkulator. Is it a smash? Never... You know, listen, I saw plenty of Instagram posts with a lot of ass shaking out in the streets. It's, hood, it's hood famous. Bold. It's hood, it's, look, it's hood rich. It's hood <laughs> famous. It's, it's good to go. So the streets love it. So that's all that matters. Boom. 
So, <laughs> and but you know that song almost didn't see the light of day due to some static surrounding the clearance of the Planet Rock sample. And then next thing you you know after the show, you and I were having this like full blown discussion about the art and the chaos of samples. <laughs> Um, absolutely. Sampling is, um, one of the things that we talked about this, like hip hop as a cultural juggernaut wouldn't be what it is today had sampling not been part of that equation in those early years to help bridge the gaps like sampling. There's an art to it. One of the greatest samplers ever in my opinion is q-tip those a tribe called mm. quest records are chopped and beautiful and full of everything you want and it is what sampling should be <laughs> now since you brought this up if you if we're going to talk about chop masters we cannot not bring in dj Premier. we cannot primo is the primo is the master of chops absolutely on, that's, listen that's, that's the chop master right there. So, mm -hmm. boom back. I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you about Kamal, about mm -hmm. Q-Tip, absolutely. But Primo is Primo. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And the scratches on, um, you know, just some of the most legendary scratches that are also like their own kind of bridges and hooks. Like he's just so good. So shout out to DJ Premier as well. The toughest out there. Mm -hmm. So by definition, a sample is using a portion of a pre-existing recording in your musical composition. Mm -hmm. So it could be a drum pattern, horns, it could be vocals. Mm -hmm. And so here's a funny story. When I was in high school, every Sunday night, and I went, I went to high school here in Georgia, mm -hmm. uh, every Sunday night, I would tune into the Rhythm and Vibe show with Randall Moore and Talib Shabazz on WRAS, which was uh, which is Georgia State University's radio station, mm -hmm. and um, so it was four hours of nothing but hip hop. Like you couldn't get, they weren't playing hip hop like that on on the big station, right? <laughs> right here in, in Atlanta, you had to go to the underground stations, the college stations, to get your mm -hmm. hip hop. So anyway. From the early 90s until the early 2000s, like they were the hip hop staple here. And one of my favorite segments of theirs was a segment called Sample Clearance. Okay. And so what they would do is they would play a current rap song and then immediately follow it with the original composition. Hot. And then the callers would have to call in with the correct name and title of the song. And you win a prize. You nice. know, you win a prize. And I thought that was a, a dope, you know, segment. It, mm -hmm. you know, it really sharpened your ears as a hip hop head. You know, if you if you fancy yourself like a, a producer in the making, mm -hmm. it was a great way of sharpening your tools as a producer, as a crate digger, you know, whatever you want to call yourself. Yep. So but today there is a rapper slash producer by the name of Rock Marciano. And I, full disclosure, I'm not really familiar with my guy here. Mm -hmm. But Rock Marciano is not a fan, would not have been a fan of sample clearance today. Because Rock Marciano calls that sample snitching. Do we have that clip ready? We do. We do have a clip. I'm not with rules, man. You know, there are no rules. But sample snitching is is a no-no. Like, stop telling people what people use. I mean, I, I guess with the internet, you can't control it. People are going to just, you know, type, and they just want to, you know, share with the people that's innocent. It's not like they're trying to do it, because I've had people hit me up about sample sets for projects that I've put out. And, you know, and they've asked me, like, yo, you know, I got, like, six of the samples. Or, yo, you can help me find the other ones or let me know. And I'm like, well, you know, you're going to get me sued, you know what I'm saying? So a lot of times it's just fans, man, and they just, you know, genuinely, you know, you know, they just want to spread the word, and it's just culture of sounds and samples. So, you know, but snitching is a no-no. I, I, I'm not feeling it. 
all the other cats is just snitching because people don't take their beats or people don't like their beats. So they want to just go online and post just stuff and call lawyers and stuff like that. Like, he did. <laughs> what you yeah. think about that, J. Ray? So, for you know, this is an age-old conversation. Um, Premier, who we just mentioned, talks about this. If you go back and you listen to, I think there's a, a, a interlude on Moment of Truth where Premier talks about this very thing where he's just like, stop telling people what folks are using, right? Um, because there is an art to sampling and sometimes you just don't know, right? <laughs> sometimes to your point, like D- Sir Daniel, it might be like a drum, it might be a drum break or a loop or something like really small that you just don't know what it is. Okay, but but two, here's my thought, as a creative, As a creative and as someone who works with creatives and manages creatives, I think it's one of those situations where if you get caught doing this, you just got to pay. Like there, listen, folks, these musicians have put their blood, sweat and tears into creating a piece of work. So if you are inspired by said piece of work to create your own piece of work, which is valid and amazing, it's done across artistic mediums, you should be able, you should do that. But just know (laughs) that if that thing that you do gets really big, they come in and you need to be prepared for the fact that they're coming. And it's okay that they come because you want to get your coin just like they want to get their coin. So, but I think to the, so I don't, I don't, um, the, the, I guess there are folks who like specifically go out and point out specific things. I think that's ridiculous. Like, I don't, I, unless it's the creative that created the thing and they're like, da, 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 whatever, whatever, or something, or there's some connection. The point is. Yeah, folks need to folks need to get paid for the stuff that they created. So um, I didn't realize. Well, I did realize because, like I said, Premier talked about it. But, you know, folks going to talk. Folks going to talk. That's what's going to happen. People are going to talk because people get excited. Sir Daniel, you just talked about the show where it, they had a section called sample clearance where you play a song and then you play the song that was that part of that song might have been derived from as a music head. That is the most amazing thing in the world because you're like, oh, my God, that came from that. That's hot. That producer right there just did something dope. I respect that. But yeah, absolutely. And I think it's also a part of you want to be first. Like, right. Oh, I remember, it's like, you know, a pair of new sneakers. I got mm-hmm. these first. Well, <laughs> I know where this sample came from first and I got the vinyl. Mm-hmm. It's bragging rights, you know? Yep. But to um to your point, to Rock Marciano's point, if it is um declared that you have infringed on somebody's copyright, which is really what it is, copyright infringement. Boom. They are coming for you. <laughs> and J Ray, I have there's a few songs that and whole catalogs that never saw the light of day due to failed clearances. Example number one, mm-hmm. 2018, Nicki Minaj um, dropped her Queen album, mm-hmm. and she re- she was on Funkmaster Flex's show talking about this dope collaboration. <laughs> Ooh, excuse me, y'all. Mm-hmm. This dope collaboration that she has with a legendary, iconic artist, and this is going to be the summer jam of 2018. And I think they dropped a couple bombs <laughs> and it was a song that she that was called Sorry. So- Sorry. Mm-hmm. Which sampled mm-hmm. Tracy Chapman's Baby Can I Hold You. Mm-hmm. Now here's the thing. All my all my reggae dance hall fans out there, you know <laughs> that um a reggae artist by the name of Foxy Brown back in the mid eighties, early nineties, did a song called Sorry that Replay was a reggae version of Baby Can I Hold You Tonight, but and nobody said anything about it. So I mm-hmm. think maybe Nikki and Nikki's team were thinking, we're sampling this record. We're recreating this record. Mm-hmm. 
So, <laughs> but um, when they found out it was actually Tracy Chapman <laughs> and sent in the request, Tracy Chapman politely said no. 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 No, guys. Thanks. Pull, take this song off of your album <laughs> and hand over $450,000 in copyright infringement settlement. Which, So that track never saw the light of day. And I heard it. Mm-hmm. I heard it in passing. It, it was cool. Mm-hmm. You know, it could have been a moment for Nikki. It, it may have, you know, taken that album to another place. We don't, we don't know. But what we do know is that Tracy Chapman ultimately says no ma'am nope. and took her sample back nope and that's not the only um project that this has happened to no um there is a very famous um the biggest pop star in the world y'all this has happened to so we are in fact talking about the queen b beyonce okay beyonce, beyonce. <laughs> so it can happen to anybody everybody <laughs> it can happen to be it happened to beyonce if it happened to beyonce, album, right? the b-day album absolutely so back in 2007 um beyonce was of course um, building her empire um and decided that she was going to do a deluxe version of b-day awesome mm-hmm. Who doesn't want that? It did include, though, a song. Um, It was called Still in Love Kissing You. So it 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 took inspiration from (laughs) Desiree's Kissing You, which was on the Romeo and Juliet soundtrack. It was like 98. So it was like a song. And so team did the thing. Same thing that Nikki's team did. Send in the request. Do the thing. But here's the thing. Here's where here's the gotcha. They sent in the stuff and dropped the album before the stuff was cleared, though. (laughs) And that's where the no-no happened. Um, A big no-no. And can I say, remember, this is when physical copies were a thing. Physical CD copies. This deluxe edition included a, a DVD with a video that she shot. And I think Beyonce was clearly a fan of this song. Huge and fan. And she said in her creative process, sometimes she just creates songs just because she loves them mm-hmm. and she, she wanted to sing it. And the, the people, the team around her was like, this is hot. Yes. This needs to be on the album. And like you said, they um, they were a little too quick on the draw. Yep. And so what happened? Yeah, they had to pull the deluxe edition, y'all. So they literally had to stop selling a already released record and pull it. So if you, here's, here's, the, here's the gag, right? If you go to Spotify right now and type <laughs> in Still in Love Kissing You, you don't get that song because it's not ever going to be anywhere. It was pulled. And so, yeah, sample clearances. Um, as a person who manages a, cre- a, a singer-songwriter, Sample Mm. clearance is so important. I have been literally in front of my computer caught with what is this that's on this the the list of things that have been like, you know, say asking questions, like making sure that the email was responded to that nothing is that got missed because you want to make sure that. And for me, for my client, I want to make sure that my client is getting what my client needs to get. And the only way to do that is you got to pay attention to stuff like sample clearances being properly cleared. (laughs) Well, the Royalty Network made sure that they They collected $150,000 in damages. I keep bringing up this money because I want y'all to realize this stuff is expensive. Expensive. It can get really expensive. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned, you mentioned, um, well, you mentioned, um, uh, platforms, streaming platforms, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Another another group that oh. you will never hear on a streaming platform. And cry about the, it, y'all. Cry about it. It's terrible. The legendary hip-hop group De La Soul. They, Their entire catalog, like from Three Feet High and Rising, Balloon Mind State, uh, De La Soul is dead. Yep. 
you ain't finna get that on a on None streaming of it. service. Nope. The the artificial intelligence stuff, the bionics and the all of that, the mosaic thump, all of this stuff, like truly groundbreaking, like a, a series of groundbreaking work, literally some of the most highly regarded hip hop. Mm -hmm. from the golden era but even outside of it right um you get the new you get the stuff that they released independently you so the stuff from like 2004 on but they've been releasing Mm -hmm. records since 1989 so everything prior to the grind date is not available on you can't stream it you can't get you can't buy it anywhere here's the unless Unless, Unless, yes, you run into a a copy at a um at a vinyl uh, a vinyl um seller uh, like this coming weekend. I'm heading to the Atlanta Records Show, mm-hmm. and I guarantee you, if anybody has a copy of say Three Feet High and Rising, mm-hmm. oh, you're gonna get taxed for that copy of that record. Oh, that thing is not it's gonna be cheap at all. It's probably gonna be the upwards of fifty dollars. Oh, more than and that. More, more, more. That. Yeah. That's, that's the cheap side, right? That's the cheap side. So That got scratches. Three, <laughs> that, exactly. <laughs> and speaking of Three Feet High and Rising, did you, did you know that that album itself contains 60 samples alone? Right. So that's 60 clearances that weren't taken care of properly. And that's why you can't stream it anywhere so let's put this in perspective right so let's put this in perspective y'all and this is really really important because we sir daniel talked about this at the very top samples are a lot of things so when we're talking about clearing a sample you might have one song where that produced that that beat maker was like i want a piece of this and a piece of that and a piece of this to make up this song right so yes you had to clear all of those things so the label that they were signed to at the time and this is tommy boys so this is a very well known they they did not handle the sample clearances for the de la soul records properly and to and and as a result they literally cannot um put the catalog up so many many moons ago uh, i guess it's probably a decade ago now de la soul um was like we're just gonna put everything up for free like you could just download the catalog for free and so people ran to the interwebs <laughs> because it was the only way you're gonna give the only way they could get it out there and it was like for this window of time you could literally go and get like just go get whatever you want <laughs> you know what i'm saying <laughs> I, I don't know if you remember that but i do specifically remember there was like this big yeah. like listen de la soul's catalog is online for like uh, today so go get it <laughs> so get it now or else you you just won't be able to get it unless you come across it yep uh, and pick it up off of somebody's um somebody's nana's garage sale <laughs> but um i also want to remind you speaking of anniversaries May 27th marked the 24th anniversary of the Notorious B.I.G. tribute, I'll Be Missing You, Hmm. by Puff Daddy featuring Faith Evans. Mm -hmm. And you want to know what's so special about that song? Legend has it is that Sting, the the leader of the iconic band, The Police, Mm -hmm. earns about two grand a day. Man, can you imagine two grand a day for the past 24 years because he receives 100% of the royalties because of from that song because the samples were never cleared? Yeah, man, never cleared. Can you believe that? I, I can believe it. I can believe it. We talked about um, Planet Rock last week and so one of the things that had to happen back then was um ben Bada had the agreement was made with Kraftwerk that they would get paid a dollar for every unit sold so this is the world right so this is how this is how different the world is today we were talking about units sold so that means physical products right <laughs> so for physical every copy. Physical yep. copies, these records that we have behind us, right? So that was the that was what that was the equivalent to. So when we think about, so I'm not surprised. Um, 
uh, about uh, Sting and um and and for a period of time, and we talked about this where Sting would go on stage with like. Uh, with Puff and with he was Puff then Daddy. Puff, yeah. And then he was Puff, and then he was Diddy. yeah. It was a lot of things. So with Diddy and Faith and do the song right. So man, getting sample clearances um, right is really important because what Sting didn't do, and this is a business decision, kids. Here we go, kids. This is a business decision. Sting didn't say pull the song. <laughs> Sting didn't he said, say that. Run me my money. He Run me said, my money. Is what let it play. <laughs> you want me to show up to the MTV um, Music Awards? Sure, I'll be there. I'm getting paid for it. Absolutely. And a little piece of um, history here, so a, you know, a little nugget here. I'll be missing you, which is a song um, that samples "Every Breath You Take" by the Police. It was released in 1983. Mm-hmm. And guess what day? What day? May 20th. Get out of, on my birthday, on my that's on a, my that, my sixth birthday, y'all. That's a little nugget for for you, J. Ray. I that didn't was know that. <laughs> on my sixth birthday, the police dropped that beautiful song um, from what I think ended up being their final album, their final official record. Like, um, as so a group. Y- as a group, yeah. And then Sting okay. went on to have a solo career um, after that. But, you know, that that catalog, you just can't front on because, you know, the, Roxanne is another one that's been sampled a lot. But, um, yeah. yeah. Um, Big time. $2,000 a day. Wow. $2,000 a day. And I know it sounds ridiculous to some of the viewers and listeners. And you may ask, y'all might be asking out there, why sample in the first place? And that goes back to the discussion that you and I have had on several occasions that sampling goes just beyond just making beats, right? Yes. Sampling the art itself acts as a bridge between generations. Absolutely. It gave us Gen Xers something to bond with over, to bond with our boomer parents, right? Yep, yep. And not only that, sampling is the foundation of rap's major hits. There, there are a few that we're going to talk about right now mm-hmm. that they probably, no, not probably, they took hip-hop as a culture and a, a music genre to a whole nother level yep. because of the art of sampling. Absolutely. Um, and the first song that we can talk about is which is probably the first biggest major rap hit from the first major rap Rap label label. yeah rapper's delight rapper's delight absolutely just a um a huge hit um of a song there's so much history around that song we could take a show just talking about the history of rapper's delight we're not going to do that today but it's a the, Sugar Hill Records, period. baby. The history of Sugar Hill Records needs. Oh my God! There's probably artists that would call us and be like, "I have stories. Call me." But <laughs> they but, still owe me money. They still owe me so much money. But um, that that particular song. Um, so I was I was young. I think I was three when that song came out. So I can't say that I have a memory of when rapper's delight hit but it's such a ubiquitous song that it feels like it has always existed same mm-hmm. yep yeah it's one of those it, it tracks just feels like it's, it's always been there right yep At every party absolutely um and so when we think about okay so let's uh, sir daniel so there's an interesting tidbit that i didn't know about this song so I always just assumed it was a sample. Mm-hmm. You were telling me like it's actually not a a straight sample. What did they do that was interesting with this one? So the genius that Sylvia Robinson was, and she was a genius. Like mm-hmm. you know, she was a, she was a gang she was gangster with gangster. it. But she was a, a genius. <laughs> she had she assembled the Sugar Hill Gang, which is a whole nother story. <laughs> of of rappers she assembled mm-hmm. this this rap group and when they went into the studio to record over to record um rappers delight 
typically what um, rap crews would do is they would have the DJ mm-hmm. just looping the mm-hmm. break, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. on turntables like just bringing it and dropping it on the one at the same specific spot on the record so it sounded like a continuous beat mm-hmm. and that beat was the baseline for good times when mm-hmm. it breaks down you hear that don't 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 so don't, they don't. kept that mm-hmm. the dj would keep that going but sylvia said you know what i don't need any any mess ups i don't need any um anything messed up during this recording because recording probably costs a lot of money mm-hmm. and then back then they were doing it on the reel so they mm-hmm. want to make sure they got a good sound she had a band replay the hit yep. by chic mm-hmm. we gotta say we gotta mention now Sheik. rogers now and bernard rogers. edwards what's up y'all legends and <laughs> legends and they replayed that riff of good times which is now today the biggest hit, you know, one of the major rap songs that took hip hop to the next level. Mm-hmm. And it's wild. It's, it's just one of those things. But then if you fast forward to the 90s, the early, early 90s, we are in full effect <laughs> as a culture. <laughs> and here comes this brother from Oakland, California. Yeah. who had been bubbling on the scene since about 87. Yep. But it took 1990 when mm-hmm. he released You Can't Touch This to just completely out of here. Out of this out of here. It was that song was everywhere. <laughs> MC Hammer, of course, I'm talking about MC yep. Hammer. Um released You Can't Touch This in 1990. It earned him a Grammy for best R&B song, which is weird. <laughs> and he earned, a, he earned a Grammy for best rap solo performance. He also got nominated for best record of the year at the Grammys in 1991. Mm-hmm. He won best rap video and best dance video at the 1990 MCV Music Video Awards. The song peaked at number one on the Billboard charts in several countries. It was huge. Not just here, not just here in the United States, in several countries yeah, around man. the world. Yeah, man. So, I mean, and who does? What's the mainstay of that song? What's the main part of that song? Where does it come from, J. Ray? Tell Baby, me. listen, Rick James classic from Street Songs, Super Freak, and if you remember that, first of all, that was huge for Rick. That song mm-hmm. was already big. <laughs> the song was already Maybe. big. And so by the time, so let's put this in perspective for Rick James and why this was really important. By 1990, Rick James was not the Rick James in 1981 that did street songs. There was a whole lot of stuff that took place. We could do a whole show on that. There's a whole lot of <laughs> whole stuff that took place <laughs> in that. A whole lot that, of right, going on. A whole <laughs> lot, baby. Um, and so that song made a lot of money for rick you know what i'm saying having that a lot of money for rick james and he talked about like listen no the checks was exactly what they needed but listen he had to sue he had to sue to get did he had to sue to get it he had to sue to get a writer's credit which which then made him um culpable to get those fees to get that money to get all those royalties which you know at that time he needed Mm mm-hmm yeah. Um, so they pull, of course, and I can only imagine how much money this costs outside of the of the money it costs to give back to pay back royalty fees. Like, what did it take to pull physical copies of albums, mm-hmm. records, CDs, cassettes, pull them, repackage them, and put you know just so that Rick James' name could be included in the writer's credit. Mm. That sounds like a lot of money too. It sounds like a lot of money, but here's where that pers- here's where that comes in, and that's really interesting. I was watching something um, really recently, and it was an interview with somebody, and they were saying, <laughs> you know, that's when w- CDs was really expensive. What they were mm-hmm. alluding to was the fact that the markup on CDs was so high that the music industry was making money hand over fist on this physical product that we were going out to buy and this is when they were still doing long boxes long box i don't even know if y'all remember they would have had a long box 
in that cardboard packaging which I don't just even know why they did that. I have no idea. Just terrible for the environment. <laughs> awful, awful, awful. Because you threw that away and you were still left with the jewel case. Right. That still had the, um, the, the insert the liner. and all of that stuff insert in there. So, you know, a different point in time. And so that actually brings us to our kind of modern example. A modern hit. Which is funny because it sounds this next song it kind of strays away from rap mm -hmm. because Robin Thicke is not a rapper. No. However, because of the impact of hip hop music, it that led to the marriage between super producers, super hip hop producers working with everybody. Yes. Singers, rappers, you know, classical art, everything. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you had an artist, you had a producer like Pharrell Williams working with a Robin Thicke mm -hmm. back in 2013 when the monster, another monster called Blurred Lines, it was everywhere. I mean, you could not turn on a TV commercial. You couldn't turn on the radio um, and not hear the song. It spent 12 weeks on the U.S. Billboard Hot 100 charts. Wow. It was a big song. It's huge. It led. The song went diamond in wow. 2018. Wow. 2018, that's five years later from mm -hmm. its release. The song earned upwards of 14.8 million, well, sold 14.8 million uh, copies, streams, whatever at that time, So, which gave it a diamond certification. So that means... Lots of money, right? Lots of money. <laughs> and you know, the first time I heard, at, I know you heard it too. The first time you heard Blurred Lines, we all were like, oh, dun, dun, dun. Yeah. Do, 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 do. Wait, this is. This, this is definitely got to give it up by Marvin Gaye, right? The the song that played at every party that my parents had when I was a kid. This is that, right? They just, this is that song, this right? like their sample. This is like a sample or whatever. And then it was like, oh, it's. It's not? It's, no, they went everywhere and said, this is not, no, it's not a sample. It, it is creatively inspired or it was a vibe like the song, like, um, like Got to Give It Up, which came out in 1977. Mm -hmm. But uh, a judge <laughs> finally said, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> you owe the Marvin Gaye estate 50% of royalties. And a nearly five million dollar copyright infringement lawsuit. Listen, listen. I okay. So this is when that song came out. When that song, I was in the club, mm -hmm. and it it surprised me, based on the music that was playing, that Marvin Gaye came on, and okay. then somebody else was singing and i said to my friend like oh what is this like i don't know what this is and they was like oh i think this is the new robin thick song and i was like oh that's interesting that yeah you know okay that's interesting and then when we started to learn that oh no no no, no it wasn't a sample it's like inspired by i was like baby this is um this is this is close so you know what this so if you go back you watch the last show y'all um, if it's still up, hopefully it'll still be up. So if you go back and you watch the last show, um, we talked about this very thing where it's just like uh, Bill Conti and the Cool and the Gang, how there was that song and it was very similar. It's so similar that people were like, so Bill Conti just ripped like Cool and the Gang, right? For the Rocky soundtrack. But according to the liner notes, that wasn't it. Bill Conti is listed as the composer. It was a different time. That was the early 1970s. By 2015, when this case, uh, I think the case was actually uh, started, was brought in like 2014, but I know that I wrote about it in 2015, and I'll make sure I drop that link. Um, this was already something that was like, eh, I don't know, y'all. I don't know. This feels really similar. And you should probably have Marvin Gaye in the liner notes somewhere. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it because what they it's a it's um you know logistically it's different. Um we're talking about semantics here. They mm -hmm. call it interpolation, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Where 
say you you know Pharrell and Chad and all of them, they're musicians. They can play instruments. Mm -hmm. So if a if a sample, an original composition is replayed, but you might speed it up or mm -hmm. you might double up on a beat or whatever, mm -hmm. they call that an interpolation. Mm -hmm. But that'll still cost you. That'll still cost you. And there was that'll a period of time in hip in, in in music where we could go back to some old hip hop CDs and you will see interpolation of X song. Like it was still noted in the liner notes that this was derived from this melody, you know, interpolation of whatever melody it was derived from. So that you knew so it was really clear. So yeah, Blurred Lines is a, a really interesting case study, especially in modern um, music. I also think it was um, something that ended up scaring kind of this new music model, because here's the difference between 2013 and, or even let's let's just go to 2021. Here's the difference in 2021 than in 1990. The they not making the same money. <laughs> they not making the same money on because you don't have physical product and you're not making that crazy markup no more. So the, the money that was flowing, that was able to kind of uh, uh, fund all of these things, is just different now. So I'm sure that there are producers today that are afraid to sample because they're like, oh my God, that is really going to cut into my margin in a way that I'm really uncomfortable with. And I would, and, and I think I would add, um, but I think it's really important that we rebuild some of those connections because I feel like there is the point you made earlier. We were able to relate to older music because it was put it, it gave us a context to enter the conversation. So I was then able to go back to track you know tracks from the 60s and the 70s and listen to them with fresh ears and be like oh this was dope then so i love what this producer did with it or i would just prefer to listen to this old version of this like i like the way this is it gave you a different appreciation for music in my opinion as a person coming from the golden era of the hip-hop generation and i would go further to say that the art of sampling allowed for a lot of the artists that were sampled, mm -hmm. a lot of black musicians, especially mm -hmm. that came up in the era that were robbed. They got robbed blind Ooh. by these contracts. They did. They, they didn't make a lot of money during their heyday, mm -hmm. but you know, here we come along with these kids mm -hmm. and revitalize your work of art and now these people have earned you know can get the money that was due them yes that, that maybe the record label never gave them in the past you know it's a way for a lot of classic artists a lot of our um you know our, our legends to be revered and given a second shot yes. in my opinion no. you know through the art of sampling and reintroducing it to new generations because i really feel like Black music, this thing we call hip hop, just black music in general, is something so unique to black people mm -hmm. that I don't want to see it die. Right. And one of the ways in which we kept it alive mm -hmm. was the art of sampling. I agree. But you know, you know, and that's not we're not putting down anybody because mm -mm. uh, I get it. It all those numbers, five million dollars. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to come up off of five right. million dollars. Because of a mistake that somebody didn't check and say, oh, this needs to go to this publishing house for clearance. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the music itself is, you know, if I drop it, something that I drop on the turntables and it gets the floor packed, you know, you can't you can't buy that that no. feeling. No. From a DJ's perspective or the person on the um, on the dance floor. You can't yeah. buy that. So, Sir Daniel, what are a couple two three of your okay. top joints that get the party mm. started that contain samples from the your perspective okay so i'm gonna say 
hypnotized by Notorious B.I.G. My God. Yes. Which samples Herb Albert's mm-hmm. Rise. Mm-hmm. Just the, from the beginning of the oh, mm-hmm. oh, oh, you know, that's a, that that makes you automatically, it just sends a mm-hmm. jolt through your body and, mm-hmm. you know, people just start dancing. When that first came out, it was, the yeah. party was crazy. Mm-hmm. Especially, and it, you know, especially since um, it dropped yeah. shortly after, after Big Pat was not yeah. passed, was killed. Was killed. Yeah, was murdered. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it gave it just the energy behind that it made people party even harder. So yes. that that definitely comes to mind. That's um one of my favorites. Uh, okay, so if we're gonna keep it in in the same vein mm-hmm. of Notorious B.I.G., another one for me, Little Kim's Big Mama thing. Oh yeah 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 yeah. Good choice. <laughs> if you like the intro of that song, it's it, whoever produced it might have produced um, Big Mama Thing and mm-hmm. um, Hypnotize, but it had that same one, two, one, two, three, four, boom, hey, mm-hmm. you know, the beat comes in. And um, that sample, Sylvester's, uh, was it something that I said? Mm-hmm. And so it just, you know, the song is just crazy. It's, it has one of the. It has one of the craziest um, introduction lyrics ever. <laughs> I don't know if there are kids watching, and we so we may not want to repeat it. Right. But if you were a Kim fan, you mm-hmm. know exactly. Yeah. Somebody in the chat to... right now is probably typing. <laughs> Listen. Yep. Go ahead. Put it in the chat. You know exactly how she starts it off, and that's like that's one of those rap songs. Like I used men, to be... women. Everybody say it when it, when she starts rapping. Everybody's just. Jigging, they rapping. Yeah. I used to be scared. Of all of that, all of that. And um, okay, and so my last one, mm-hmm. which you're you're probably going to be surprised by this, but I love it just because I love the the me- melody of this song. But Three Six Mafia, Stay Fly. Ah, I gotta stay fly. Ah, 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 ah. But that's not the sample. The sample part is that. Am I high? Uh, uh, uh. Uh, it's tell me why has our love turned by turn cold by Willie Hutch. Man, good Willie choice. Hutch who, Willie Hutch who produced um a lot of stuff. I can't even think right now, but mm-hmm. but yeah, that's where that sample comes from. And so the part where the people are singing, that vocal comes from the Willie Hutch record. Tell me why has our love turned cold? Tell me why. Tell me why has our love turned cold? That, that's it. So go to Spotify and play all three of them joints uh, straight from DJ Sir Daniel. Um, My picks. Yes, My picks. those is your picks. So real quick, real quick. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> so I mean, okay, let me guess. This is something. That, this is a, a, a why do you know? This is oh, a, I, ladies and gentlemen. What you're about to hear is another J Ray. Why do you know that moment? So just get your notepads out and get ready for these gems. And he's about to present to you. Please. So, folks, we are going to talk about Walk This Way by oh. Run DMC, which there is a before and after this song, which is really mm. interesting to think about. But it was such a huge monster of a song that neither of the groups who were in it really wanted to do. Rick Rubin, who produced it, is the only one who was interested in this song. Mm. And it paid off for both groups. So I'm not going to rehash the history of Walk This Way because you can read that, you can look it up. But, but here is something interesting. And I put this album cover up very specifically, Sir Daniel. <laughs> so, um, Sir, Sir Daniel, I don't know what, uh, so everybody who's watching this, I have no idea what Sir Daniel is about to say. So I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to ask you a question real quick, Sir Daniel. And then um, I'll continue with, with going through this kind of interesting tidbit. When you okay. look at this cover, this cover that is on the screen... Mm-hmm. What is the first thing that jumps out at you? Whatever it is. That it's, it's only Run DMC's name on the on the cover. 
That is interesting. That is not what I was going for, but we're going to talk about that. That is really okay. an interesting observation. Um, because what I want to talk about is this actual photo. Um, so, so here's the thing. Um, one, we're going to put this in context. Uh, okay. This was from this was the lead single for Run DMC's Raisin Hell record. They had already mm. had like Rock Box and they had already had King of Rock. So they were already kind of on. Rick Rubin had them on. Well, Rick Rubin was really in the rock. So he did it with LL. He did it with the Beastie Boys and he was doing it with Run DMC where it's kind of like this rock. Rock rap. Yeah, it was like a rock yeah. rap thing. Well, this particular record um the 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 photo is interesting because for the record label profile was their record label at that time profile records mm -hmm. this is the first seven inch that they did a cover for before this record every other album was just a plain you know a basic sleeve and the 45 mm -hmm. but for this there was the the picture cover and here's why because the picture's real dope so <laughs> A photographer by the name of Glenn Friedman did the photography for this particular photo. And there's some like really important call outs, right? So one behind run DMC. So you got jam master J DMC and run behind them. You see Hollis town. So they're of Hollis course from town. Hollis Queens. Hollis you Queens. know where they yep. from. They from Hollis Queens. So it got Hollis town behind them. They just found a wall, got Hollis town behind them. They, kind of like it's almost perfectly arranged i think it was purposefully arranged the thing on them that you pay attention to is the era adidas like it's on purpose yeah. they crispy. want you to yeah. see the three stripes and they white and they crispy because run dmc repped adidas like top to bottom mm -hmm. so that was all yeah. strategic they actually became the first rap group with an endorsement for sneakers. So when we talk about Yeezys today, Run DMC pioneered that. So Totally. So listen, let's just call it what it is. Like they pioneered that. Here's what's Absolutely. interesting. So this cover dope as it is, it's iconic. It's like we're going to put this is going to be the 45 cover for this. Profile Records paid Glenn $100. They paid him $100 for this. And I can tell you that this a copy of this probably goes for more than $100. Copy of this right now, I'm sure, if you got the original, I'm sure goes for more than that. They paid him $100. So here's what wow. happened. Glenn was not happy about this. Because <laughs> oh, even man. then, and you know, this is 1986. It's like, oh my God, like this is a dope cover. Y'all are going to use it. Like this is really good. Y'all going to give me $100 for this. And that's exactly what they did. So he wasn't happy and he told Run, here's the dope shit. He's, and he's quoted, this is, uh, uh, I found this quote online. And he said, I told Run what the label did to me. He said, run, reached in his pocket and peeled off four $100 bills and dapped them up. So run picked up the tab for this cover, essentially. And so putting this in the context of sampling, right? So this song, of course, includes the iconic sample from, which we're about to talk about in a minute because you brought up something interesting, from um, Aerosmith. But... We're, what we're really talking about is artists getting paid for the work that they do. That's mm. ultimately what we're talking about. And Still. even this photographer at that time in 1986 was like, $100 is not what y'all should be peeling me off for this, this, this cover. So I want to end that there because I know we're getting close to time. The other important right. Can thing. Can I say real quick? I'm sorry, ahead. just real quick. Uh -huh. I'm noticed in this, in this picture, Run looks like he's reaching for the hammer, right? He does now. Re look like he's reaching for the and hammer, he right? Like he, he's about to cock back and, and blow somebody, and Jay is like, no, don't no, do it. No, don't do it. it. <laughs> DMC. I DMC. Mean, DMC. Um, so, the other important thing this was a, a different sort of collaboration in that it was new. So, Aerosmith. 
they're on the back so if you look at the back side i didn't put that here they're listed as the the sole writers of the song which is interesting okay. because you know run and dmc have lyrics on the song but the 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 writers are listed as just um uh steve uh steve tyler and tyler. um uh joe perry i think it's joe perry i would think i got yeah don't 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 okay. dig, dig me if i got that wrong but anyway <laughs> So it wasn't a thing that they did. They didn't put featuring Aerosmith on this, even though if you flip it over, it just says that um, Steven Tyler and, and Joe Perry. I it's Joe Perry. It. Yeah, perfect. I did my Googles. It's perfect. Joe Thank you. <laughs> they appear courtesy of their label. I think it was Geffen at the time. That's all they got mm-hmm. as like a credit. Um, so I just wanted to pull this up and talk about you know that cover and kind of what happened with um the photographer as we think about folks getting paid and samples and stuff like that so there is one thing we have to do though before we close out we got to talk about (laughs) dj sir daniel we have to talk about um there are some tweets that have um so (laughs) so we I'm, not, I'm noticing a theme here. Every week, Mariah Carey ends up in, in our tweets. She's, <laughs> oh, but funny. she's the gift that keeps on giving. Like, Mariah Carey is seriously funny. She's hilarious. She <laughs> but there was a rap group that um, did a song that sampled um, Shake It Off, mm-hmm. right? I can't even remember the name of Neither the group right now. I think it's called KITG or something like that. And they sampled M- Mariah Carey's 2005. No, it might have been 2005, 2006. Yeah, um, hit "Shake It Off," right? Mm-hmm. They produced the video for it and everything. <laughs> and this it, this video is full of gangs and guns and ski masks and you know foolishness. On it, it looks like a TikTok video, right? It does. <laughs> And so they released it, and of course, because it samples Mariah Carey, which is the, you know, she's the pop R&B princess, Mm -hmm. queen, Mm -hmm. and then you have this hardcore group sampling her with this hardcore imagery. So somebody decided, they were, you know, they thought it'd be funny, oh, let's post the video, and let's put it up on Twitter, and somebody reposted the video on Twitter and said, Mariah Carey has 24 hours to respond. Mm. Now, Mariah Carey being the clap back queen said, how about y'all have 24 hours to respond to my lawyers? Hey. Within the next day, that song is gone. gone. <laughs> that song was taken down. <laughs> you never heard of them again. And, it, you know, sampling is still, it's still a thing. You, got, you have to clear it, kids. You got to clear these samples. You got to clear, clear these samples. So, listen, what are some Do your of due diligence. Your, yes, absolutely. So, w- please email us. Well, okay, so, uh, several things. Email us and let us know what are some of your favorite tracks that contain samples. We want to know what are some of your joints that you rock to. And also, please follow us. So, on Instagram, it's all down there at the bottom. Instagram, we're at Q Points. Uh, Twitter, we're at Q Show. And on Facebook, we're at Q Show. Follow us everywhere and tell your friends to follow us. Tell your mom to follow us. We're wholesome. As you can see, we didn't cuss. <laughs> we could have cussed. We didn't cuss. So. Well, I did curse last week, but. Oh, you know. sorry. Sorry. Oh, well. <laughs> it's all right. It's not that bad. <laughs> and before we go, yes, um, I want to thank everybody who has followed us already. Like, the numbers, I'm just like, whoa, okay, y'all are really out there supporting us. So thank you so much for that. And speaking of photography, J Ray, mm-hmm. I can't say much. But all I'm gonna say is <laughs> big up to Atlantis on Phyllis Iller, aka Melissa Alexander. She's so dope. She put your she put your boy on for a project. I can't say anything about it. I, I can't wait to I, see it. <laughs> I signed I signed the paperwork and everything. <laughs> but when I tell you, oh boy, this is this is gonna be this is iconic. Mm. This is iconic. So shout out to Phyllis Iller out there. Keep your eyes open. This is really coming. Please continue to support the show Q Points. We do this because we truly at the bottom of everything, at the root of it all, we truly care about 
black creatives and black yes. artistry, black music, photography, all of that. We truly care about it, and we love sharing this these um, this with you and mm -hmm. uh, talking about the culture. So. Please come back next week where I'm certain we are going to come up with another amazing show. <laughs> I have no clue what it's going to be about yet, but maybe you guys will send us a great topic. You see the email address down there. Mm -hmm. And in closing, J. Ray, what you, what you got? Remember, kids, in life, you can always pick up the needle and let the music play or you could turn the music off. The choice is yours. Yes! <laughs> Peace, everybody. <laughs>